Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Ernst, and we have a few topics to discuss here today. Um, we're going to just jump right into this. Some of the topics we're going to talk about here today is getting listings. Another one we're going to talk about is being consistent in your real estate business. And the next topic is kind of a couple topics in one, which is what's going on in the market right now with buyers who are getting priced out of the market, uh, trying to keep them engaged because there are multiple offer situations. Um, really, you know, sellers on the other side are pushing their prices up so high that they aren't getting anything from it too. You know, it's really just trying to find somebody a house. So that's kind of the third topic. And I think we should probably jump into that one first. So we're going to talk about really, you know, what's going on in the market right now. So you can see, and this is what the joy of real estate is, is it's a buyer's market or a seller's market. Now that's not necessarily consistent everywhere in the country or internationally. It is specific to regions, locations, areas, even streets. It's all over the place. Um, but as we could see with the fun stuff that's happened over the spring, um, that, you know, people weren't jumping into real estate for the most part. And then it kind of created a whole different demand and it pushed up prices, pushed up prices very, very high, you know, to the, to the peaks that they've ever been in certain areas. And for most people who are working with buyers, if you haven't set up the buyers from the beginning with the right expectations, this is going to be a really long journey. Okay. This is something that I, I, I've taught so many times to my buyer's agents and I've actually worked when I'm working with buyers to make sure I prepare them for this. It's about setting the expectations. Now, what are those expectations? Well, the first thing is here, we'll, we'll go into this. Let me pull up my file specifically on this because I have specific criteria for working with buyers. And if you haven't had those criteria met in the first place, you're definitely going to have issues after that. Okay. So we're going to go over the valid buyer's criteria checklist. Want to make sure that you're working with, well, the right people from the start. So if that's all right with you guys. I'm going to just jump right into this. The valid buyer criteria checklist. I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Here we go. These are the 10 criteria okay, that you want to make sure each of your buyers fit. And if they don't fit, you just kind of want to hold their hands along the way and make sure they get to this point. Now, some of you be going, Brian, you know, if I waited for all 10 criteria to fit, I wouldn't have a single buyer. Hmm, I hear you. Well, let's stick with this part here. The first part is, you know, willing to meet ahead of showings. I put willing to come to the office. We're going to old school on some things here. They want, really you want to meet with them ahead of time to make sure you have a chance to show them how you work. If you're just showing it one pro, up at one property and they don't want it or they get outbid, whatever it is, have you built the relationship? Have you set the expectations to say, this is how I work? To make sure I help you get what you need. And you've gone through all your questions to make sure you can help them. So willing to meet ahead of time. The second is they're motivated. Now, the third is a sense of urgency. And some people get this mistaken. Are they motivated to buy a house, a home, a condo, a townhouse, whatever it may be? Well, the, if the answer is yes, okay, then is it urgent? So let's just say they're in a lease right now, but their lease doesn't end for eight months. Yes, they're motivated to buy a house, but no, they're not necessarily urgent to buy a house if they're not willing to break their lease. There is a difference in this. They wanna buy a house, look, they have an expanding family, uh, whatever it may be, they wanna be in a certain school district, closer to work, closer to the trains, whatever it may be. They're motivated to do this for whatever pain that they're in, and that's usually where it comes into play. But are they urgent? How quickly do they need to find a home too? Number four, are they fully pre-approved? Now, I don't mean they've called a lender and the lender said, oh yeah, you're good to go. No, I mean their pay stubs have been turned in, their tax returns, bank statements, um, dental records, firstborn child, um, you know, blood samples, you know, all the stuff that lenders require nowadays, okay? Did you get all that, did that, the buyers get all that in ahead of time? Because if you're working with a good lender, now some banks would be like, oh, we don't put it through underwriting until we actually have a property address, and that drives me nuts, okay? Make sure you're working with a lender who can do this stuff ahead of time because 
you know, my lender can get this stuff done as little as two weeks if he gets everything in ahead of time. Well, that makes your buyer so much more powerful, especially if it's a vacant property. You're in a multiple offer situation and bam, you can close in two weeks. I mean, you're, you're going to close as fast as cash could close. You just got to figure out how to get the title ordered that quickly. Number five is they've signed an exclusive buyer agency agreement. That's pretty straightforward, I would like to think. Um, and that's something that you do when you meet them ahead of time to explain how you work. Number six, all right, number six is they're non-contingent on selling their home. But Brian, wait a minute, they can't buy another house until they sell their current house. I know, I'm just telling you what this, this is the, this is the, this is the ideal situation for everything, okay? You know, if they're contingent about selling their home, that's, an, that's more of an issue than they're contingent on closing on their home. Make sure that you have a home close contingency versus a home sale contingency. Completely different things and different motivations too. Number seven, they are willing to spend time to buy a house. They're willing to spend that time. Number eight, all the decision makers are present. Okay, I hate it when one person, the one spouse comes and the other one doesn't. Oh, I can look for the other person. Yeah, I get that. And then you bring the other person and you've shown the same properties multiple times and ultimately the other person sticks their nose up and says, no, I don't like any of these. Okay, make sure they are all, all decision makers, even if they're not on title. If it's a family member, parents, siblings, children, make sure they are coming with. Number nine, they are willing to disclose all financial information. And number 10, which is, this is sometimes more optional than anything else, but I kind of prefer this more than ever nowadays. You'll like them. You like them. These are the criteria that I use for a valid buyer. This is what I use. All right, I'm trying to show my screen here. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. All right, I'm sorry. Little issues on sharing the screen there. All right, when we're talking about this, this is just, this has nothing to do with the current market, what I just went through. If it's a good market or bad market, if you set these expectations and you get into the habit of going through these 10 criteria ahead of time, you're gonna be in a much better position versus, yeah, they wanna see it. Yeah, they, they, they talk to a lender, but you've never talked to that lender. It's not your lender of choice. You have no idea, okay? So we're trying to avoid other issues that come up down the road. Now, here's some tips that I use with my buyers. When I'm showing buyers, how many, how many homes should you, should you show to somebody before they buy a house? Well, less than six. How about that? Six or less. All right, three, that works. I actually had one of my clients ask, do most people just look at three properties before they, because this is one of my clients that saw three properties. And is it normal to look at three properties before you buy one? I'm like, normal three. You didn't look at three. You've been looking at hundreds and hundreds of properties. You've been looking online for the past six months. You've ruled it down to a specific city and a specific subdivision within that city that fits into the school districts that you want your kids within. This is the neighborhood that of the style, a home that fits your needs. And these are the three properties. It was two at the time that are available. And then later that day, another one came on the market. So we went the next day and saw that. It was three properties. That's it. This is where you want to be. And you want to be here for the next 20 years, give or take, is what you told me. So I wanted to prepare my buyers. And I told them, so if you're going to buy a place, you're going to be there for 20 years. If it needs to be painted, is that something you could handle? If it needs um, new appliances, is that something you could handle? If it needs new flooring, is that, are you budgeting for these types of things? I haven't shown them anything at this point yet. I'm preparing them for this. Okay. I am, I'm preparing them, their expectations. Um, how many buyers can buy without contingent on sale or, okay. So a home sale contingency is they haven't sold their home yet. A home close contingency is they have a contract on their place. Okay. And they're moving forward with that. Now, how many buyers can buy without a contingency? It's all different depending on the type of buyer you're working with. Okay, if you have a move up buyer, they're buying one home, they need more space to the next home, something like that. Um, 
I actually don't see home close contingent or home sale contingencies as much anymore. I just don't see it that often. Home close con home, home sale contingency, home close contingencies. I see a little bit more, but percentage wise, it's not the majority. Okay. A lot of people are that I have buying the type of properties that I sell. I don't see it as much as you think. It's not the majority of the times. And they don't have to put a contingency on the sale of their property in there though. If they have a contingency, even though they didn't put it in the contract, they may have some liability issues if they don't close on the other property, but that's a whole nother legal matter. So I don't know the exact statistics of exactly what that is, but from my experience, it isn't the majority of buyers who are out there. Okay. Uh, had a, I can read this here. Marlo had a nightmare client showed 19 homes, wrote three contracts. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, I, I've done some silly things and I'm sure I've shown way, way more than that. Okay. I have this one story that I, I heard fairly recently, this one particular person, and I, I don't know the agent personally. I don't, you know, and, and when she bought the her current house, she looked at 200 properties, 200. I'm guessing that agent didn't go through the valid buyer criteria checklist. I'm going to guess. Okay because there's more to it than these are the basic criteria of that person, let alone breaking down what they're looking for. The, the, the agent had to take another job because wasting so much time with this client, this buyer. And I'm like, this makes no sense whatsoever. You had to take another job. I averaged it out that this particular agent made $11 a showing. That's, I just averaged out what their time was, their cost was and everything. It was like $11 a showing. That's how much that agent made. That is maddening, absolutely maddening. So this is all about finding out what their needs are. And when you understand their motivation, you understand their, their time frame, you understand their criteria, it goes so much, so much quicker, okay? So in this current market with what we're going through, keeping buyers engaged is about setting the expectations up front. Hey, look, it is an interesting market. You said you wanted to buy a house because of X, Y, and Z, and your time frame is this. Okay. We're going to run into situations where you're in a multiple offer situation. Here's the phrasing I use. You need to be prepared to pay what they're asking or possibly above if you want the home bad enough. Once again, you need to be prepared to pay what they're asking or possibly above if you want the home bad enough. I'm not saying they have to pay that. I'm just saying, if you want it bad enough, you need to pay. That's all I'm saying. I'm not talking, never use the word discount, okay? Never set that expectation that they're gonna put an offer in below full price. Never put that expectation out there because you will burn yourself. You'll put offer after offer where they're putting in 10, 20% less than asking price. You're wasting your time. It's, it's asking price. And if it's a finance loan, they have a lender that's going to do an appraisal typically on this, correct? And it's kind of your safety net to say the bank is going to want you to pay, you know, too much because they're taking on that loan. I've actually told buyers more recently too, especially, you know, the buyers that um, have been working with my team is you need to be prepared to pay over the appraised value if you want that bad enough. So not only is it a safety net, but if you're going back on comparable properties in the short term, there, sometimes there isn't enough to prove that it's worth the current value because it kind of, it's, it's hit or miss. Sometimes it's, it's like it's on, it's super, super hot. And, you know, two weeks prior, it was not. It, I see this in different neighborhoods and in different areas. So you need to, you have a, you need to have a conversation with them about money, about price. And are they getting priced out of the market or are their expectations unrealistic? Okay. Prices go up on a lot of different things. Oh, I got priced out of the market. You have to be careful with your verbiage. The verbiage you use is very, very important because when you go, yeah, this place is so overpriced. No, please don't say that. One day it's overpriced. The next day it's got multiple offers, but you set the expectation. You're the real estate professional. This is what the market is saying, okay? We, we try to phrase this this way. When I'm working with sellers and they're not priced correctly, hey, this is what the market is telling you. So on the reverse side where sellers are going way high on price because things are moving, 
and they just keep adding on to what everybody else is at, you know, doing, oh, they got this, so we should get this, okay? Got to slow them down. Nine out of 10 sellers I tend to work with want, way, want more money than their home is worth. Nine out of 10. It's just, it's, it's, it's not a new thing. Uh, that's what I see all the time. But it's helping to set them to have realistic expectations too. So when a sellers want to go up way, way high, we want to make sure that from the start, if we're working with the sellers, now all these buyer problems can be solved, just to let you know, is if you focus on listings, they kind of all go away. And remember the amount of time it takes to handle a buyer is double, triple, or quadruple the time that you spend with the client versus handling a listing. So it's like, I mean, oh, Michelle, you brought up uh, some stuff about some of the listings and then you went to the buyer. It's like, you need to focus on the listing side of things. You maintain much more control over everything you're doing. That's the bigger picture. You get wrapped up in stupid problems. I don't mean to be insulting, but it's, it's, that's not the right problem. The right problem is shifting your business listing focused. You have a different mindset. But, oh, I got a buyer right here. I know, but did you set the right expectations? And I, at a certain point in my career, I just, I threw in the flag. I said, I threw in the towel. I'm, like, I'm done. I'm done with buyers. They're screwing with me. You know, they're all over the place. I wrote three different contracts and then they bought it for sale by owner without me. Okay. Now, whose fault is that? That would be my fault. That was totally my fault. I'll take credit for that. I did not have a buyer agency agreement in place. Okay. I had sold their townhouse. I thought they were half two buyers. They were. And ultimately I got burned on that one. But when it's, uh, it's a thing, if a deal doesn't go through on a buyer, you got to show them houses again on a listing. If an offer doesn't work out, so what? If it's priced right, you'll have another one. Okay. There's a whole different level of anxiety that goes into this. Can you guys pick this up a little bit? The anxiety of a buyer versus the anxiety of a seller. You can slow the seller down. Oh, it's not, it's not selling. Yep, the market is telling you you're overpriced. I, it's not me telling you. I think your place is worth a fortune, but I'm not in the market to buy a house. That being said, the market is telling you you're overpriced and need to come down. If you're not getting showings, you're ridiculously overpriced. If you are getting showings but no offers, you're overpriced. And when everybody in the feedback says, oh, it's great, it's wonderful, it looks fantastic, it's a 10 out of 10, but nobody's buying it, they're lying. They're trying to be polite. Okay. I've had sellers like, we don't want to drop the price. Everybody says it's wonderful. Yes. You've had 20 people who've said that they are lying. They have no duty to help you out whatsoever. None. They are not your agent. Heck, they probably want you to be overpriced. So their listings down the street sell easier. The market is telling you you're overpriced. So the only feedback for sellers that I want to hear if it's anything like, you know, it's great, it's bad, whatever it is, if you don't have any, a seller doesn't have an acceptable offer, it's all white noise to me, you're overpriced. Then you have several choices on the seller side. You can wait, see what happens in the market, and that's never been a great strategy, okay? Uh, you can drop the price, or you don't have to sell. You don't have to sell your house, but we want to, Brian. Okay, well. You want to wait because waiting can burn you if the prices go down because you're pricing on a straight line and if the market dips back down, we're going into kind of the, the winter season in some areas and in Illinois, it does tend to slow down. But what most people don't know is when it picks up, they think in the spring market, the spring market starts the day after Christmas, you know, in, in the Illinois area, the day after Christmas. That's when people start thinking about buying a property and selling their property. I mean, it doesn't go into full effect until usually the spring, but it starts then. So what are we doing right now? We're getting people ready to be on the market for first of the year because there's usually not in the past five years, there's just been not enough inventory in my areas first of the year. There wasn't. So there's another motivation to get sellers to get their place on the market. So what we're talking about sellers who are overpriced and that's, that's just, if you're, it's your listing, Every week, you need to be talking to them about this is what the feedback is. This is what the market is saying. These are the other properties that are for sale. You are not getting showings and you're not getting offers. The market is telling you you're overpriced. Not Brian is telling you you're overpriced. The market is telling you you're overpriced. So I have seen a bit of this too, where people started going up, up, up in a way on pricing and they get into deals and then doesn't appraise out even close. I think Rose, you had one that didn't, it was a six figure appraisal 
that was off. I mean, it was off by six figures. I was like, come on, this is crazy. I mean, it's just ridiculous, but that's what some people are doing. But in the buyer side, if they want it, they need to be willing to pay it. You're representing the buyer. It's like, well, that's not, that's not, the appraisal says this. An appraisal is just an opinion, people. That's it. That's it. If it's so hot that it can sell for that price, and if it's in multiple offers, it can probably sell again in the future in that situation if priced correctly, if it's in good condition. Think of it that way. I think of back to, you know, I was briefly in the car business before I got into real estate and while I was waiting to go into federal law enforcement, which that never happened. And, you know, people go, I never pay, I'll never pay list price for a car. Well, it's a limited edition car. We only get two for the whole year and they hold their value so much better. And the dealership isn't going to let them go for those for a invoice price on something they get two for the whole year. So if you want it, great. If you don't, we'll sell it to somebody else. But if you think the value it's what public's perception of it is. Here, let's use another example. Rolex watches. Are they the best watches in the world? No, they're good. But why do they hold their value so much? Because people want them and you can't get them. You can't get certain Rolex watches. It's supply and demand. That's what this all is. When we're listing a house or helping a buyer, it's just supply and demand. And when buyers flake out, I'm gonna say that, keeping them engaged, this starts from the beginning. It starts from setting the expectations. We may not get it, so we need to move on to the next one. We need to be prepared for the next one and keep on going. And if you know their motivation, you know their time frame, you know that they're urgent, you know that they're ready to go to pull the trigger, here you go. You got a buyer agency agreement in place. When you know all these criteria, it makes it so much easier to point out, oop, missing that one. Or, no, we got all these. We're, we're, we're still going strong here. And it's always take yourself out of the role that it's not your fault. It, look, this is the market is saying, this is what's happening on this property. And when we're getting to writing multiple offer situations, writing up those contracts, there are specific ways to do that and to win more than others, okay? I think I have some other trainings out there specifically on winning multiple offer situations because that does come up from time to time. So what are those, what are those multiple offers? Check out my videos. It's an icon agent, Brian earns free trainings in workplace and on Facebook. And I, I have some of those videos on the criteria to win multiple offer situations. And you know, some of those things are classics. You should use writing up every single offer. So that's another training entirely. So talking about keeping buyers engaged. Do um, you guys have any questions for me about that? It's up to you guys. I'm just trying to answer your guys' questions. Hey, Brian, I have a... Go ahead. Oh, is that me? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so because of the way the market is right now, um, where you know, you're having multiple offers and they're, at, they're all putting in way over asking, um, but you look at the comps and, you know, like you were talking about earlier, um, $30,000 less than what it should be. Uh, and then you get an appraisal, right? Which is just an opinion. And we really, um, we really wanted to offer what, what the comps were saying that it's valued no, at. You, you, you throw that out the window. That's just, it's, it's just a, just a scale. It's a sliding scale. It's like saying, I want to use the comps from, from 10 years ago. Okay. Well, you can in your logic. And you could say, I want to use the comps from the past three months. You can in uh -huh. your logic, but the market is saying this right now. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Yeah. So if the appraisal comes in lower, you know, that's a, that becomes a negotiation piece, right? And so it can. Yeah. It's whether, whether the buyer is willing to pay the, put up the extra cash to make up the difference, right? Well, it depends on what your negotiation power is at this point. Okay. Because mm -hmm. if you're on the buyer's side, I would have prepared my buyer for that situation, but I would have told the agent when we got the contract, hey, if we have an appraisal issue, are you guys comfortable on working with us here? Because if you're doing an FHA loan, mm -hmm. it's got to appraise out, okay? Right. Conventional, no, that's different, mm -hmm. all right? Okay. So some listing agents have no clue on getting over the appraised value. They, they're not even familiar with it. They mm -hmm. think, up oh, if it's appraised value, we got to come down to that price, and they tell their sellers to come down to it. So you got to kind of feel out the other agent to see how sharp they are. Okay. Uh, 
Got it. That's, that's the thing. You're the one in, there's no right or wrong answer on this. And it's all opinion. Well, these are the comparable properties. Yeah, that's great. It's an opinion. Okay. Yeah. That's all it is. I want to buy it based off this. Well, the seller doesn't give a crap because they're getting multiple offers. Do you know what I'm saying? So speaking yeah. on the same terminology is tough. But once you get into an offer and get into the deal and get through a lot of it too, you know, and you're kind of hinted to the other agent, what if this doesn't appraise out? Are you guys good to work with us here? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes through just fine. And I would say the majority of the time, my sellers have come down on price. The majority, over 50% of the time, all right? But there are a, a good percentage of times where we either negotiated something different and then I would say in the minority of cases, it was they stuck to the original sale price. But once you get into this, those sellers are now moving out. They're going to have to pay, if they, the deal blow, blows up, they're going to have to pay another mortgage, assessment, taxes, utilities, insurance. You kind of got them a little bit. Do you know what I'm saying? You go, hey, look, what if this happens with the next agent too? What are you going to do? Now, I know what to say in that situation. I would say, I have another appraisal. You know what I'm saying? It could be a totally different value. You know, but everybody has a different, this is doing it over and over and over. It can go either way. You kind of have to feel it out and you have to take a chance on some of these things. Okay. It's tough. And, and for myself, I just sold my townhouse, you know, geez, last month. I was actually October 1st, I think it actually closed. And that was 30 grand over asking price. And the next, the, the two closest comps, my team sold. Okay. And they're the most recent comps too. Um, it was like a 235 comp and I sold my place for 290. Same model. Wow. Okay. I thought I was overpricing it. I put a lot of stuff into the place too, but there was nothing else that was move in ready. So it was a bidding war, had nine offers on it. And what I did is I said, write it right in the contract. If there's appraisal issues, you guys are willing to pay over the appraised value, you know, and, and agree to the sale price. And they did. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. So that's something that just doing this for almost 18 years, I didn't want any hassles. And I said, nine offers. I don't want home inspections. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. Do you guys want to win this, this, this negotiations? You know, the multiple offer situation. I don't want appraisal issues. I don't want home inspections. I don't want any of this crap. I've taken really good care of the property. Obviously people can see this. Here we go. And I want to close quick. So mm -hmm. I could set my terms as a right. seller. The buyer cool. could have said, hey, it doesn't appraise out. I could say, that's yeah. great. I got other people who are ready to go. We're going to go right. with them, you know, and that, that are, are willing to forego the appraisal, you know, concern. Okay. But that's okay. a position that's, of power. That, that's awesome because it doesn't seem like the listing agent, even though she's a broker, um, probably of her own self, I don't know, but you could see all the, the, the little um, nuances that she left out and like, in our favor, she didn't even put an ad as is addendum. So um, I, I'm looking forward to a good, uh, yeah. I, it, I guess it comes down to attitude and confidence too, right? It's experience. A lot yeah. of this is experience. And if you have questions about this too, having the right people to ask these questions to, to say, what do I do in this situation? Having the right guide, coach, mentor. So I do coaching and training to walk people through this so they don't have to do multiple, multiple offers before they get one and they're worn out and exhausted and the buyers are exhausted at this point and you don't get any referrals out of that. Let's get it one and done. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions, you guys? Uh, Marcy, you got? Yeah, I'm having a problem. I have an accounting background, so it, and a deal has sure. to make sense to me. Okay. So when I look at the comps, I look at the comps. So if I'm looking at a neighborhood and it's got four houses exactly the same, but one has $50,000 more in features. I don't, I can't sell it for the same price as the one that doesn't have them. I mean, the one, I can't sell the one okay, that okay. doesn't have them. So, so where, what perspective are we coming from? The seller, the buyer, where, where, where are we right now? Actually both. It happens to be, uh, in, in, this, in this particular instance, I happen to be the buyer. I'm the buyer. I'm looking at it going, you want what for this when, and I looked at I two apples to apples, it's a condo, okay? This one has $12,000 egress window, this one does not. This one has $8,000 wet bar in the basement, this one does not. So, so Mar I, Marcia, you're looking at this to buy yourself, correct? I'm looking at it to buy myself, but okay. also the, the buyer, the seller ended up when she was between listings, 
uh, she canceled the buyer. She was asking me some questions because she was impressed with the amount of detail that I provided in terms of looking at the neighborhood. Because she, what she did was she priced it at 539, it's worth about 450. Just because some of the other ones sold for 539. Do you, I can't, do you, how can you justify that? Just okay. let it go? So it, you're overthinking this, like people are actually good at their jobs, okay? <laughs> you gotta not. understand that 97% of agents don't do two deals, at least two deals a month. The average wow. agent does about a half a dozen deals a year. How much experience can they have? In my board of realtors, you know, the last recorded year that 71% of 18,000 agents did zero or one deal. Most agents don't job. have a clue. I look up the agents when I'm gonna have a negotiation with certain people and see what their track record is, see what their experience is on listings and on buyers to see how many, and if they're on the listing side, do I have some people that I pull up and they have more, as many expireds as they have closed. And I'm like, this person has not figured this out yet. Right. They have not figured and, this and out. The so agents you, are just having them throw money at it. More staging, more paint, more. I go, you're nuts because look, look, this I'm is, just this gonna is, rip it all out. You're, you're getting upset with somebody who is, you're, you're judging them on your values and you can't do that. This is all okay. opinion. All this is opinion. There's no factual basis for any of this. 300 There's reference days on the market points. is factual. What's that? 300 days on the market's factual. No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying get, coming to a conclusion on a price is opinion. Okay. You can't say it is worth exactly 425, 5,600, whatever. You can't do that unless somebody says, I'm willing to pay that. It's two people, a seller and a buyer, coming to everything agreeing in this. This is the bigger picture where people get all emotionally wrapped up in this stuff. It's just coming to terms what both parties think are fair. That's all it is. And well, you can argue that with comparable properties. You can share that with them. But sometimes right. that backfires just as much as anything else can. Well, and the other part is that the seller conveyed to me that she was willing to say it, sell it for the fair price but the agent didn't want to do that. Two agents refused to show that to the, that offer to the seller. The agent is refusing to show an offer to a seller, the listing agent. Yeah. Then you have license law issues. Okay. Then <laughs> There's you have license law issues in every, every contract I've been, been involved in. Well, then you have to bring that up and you have to address that. Or if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Because I don't usually uh, want to take people to the board or stuff like uh -huh. that because it wastes my time. But I'll say, look, I need to sign this document saying you showed them this offer and they go, screw you. I'm not going to sign this. Okay. Well, if they write that in an email, I forwarded to the board and said, I'd like to write up a, you know, a complaint. This agent will not present my offer to their client. If it, if it were not my personal, I might do it if I were representing someone else because then it would be affecting my client. But because it's just affecting me, I just need to fight harder. You're dealing with, you're going to personalities. And most of the time, most agents don't have a high level of experience. Everybody has to come to just be aware of that. I can't tell you how many agents I feel like I've trained going through a deal on the buyer side or the seller side to walk them through it. And it usually works out pretty well. If they listen to me on one thing, I listen to me on a few more things too. That's in my client's favor, but right. it's case by case. It's situational. There's no one way to price a home. If you have three appraisals, they can all be different prices. They're opinions. And depending on the comparable properties and the other things that go into the appraisal, you know, they may be all very similar. They may be completely different. It's like having three different home inspectors come in, find three different home inspection issues. Okay. It, it happens. So all we're trying to do is come to the same terms and speak on a common language. I've had agents that come to me and says, you know, well, the price for square foot is this and you're pricing at this. I'm like, it's not something that comes up here much. Okay. So Sellers but willing to sell it for this price. If your client's interested, there we go. If not, thanks for putting the offer in. Well, the price for square footage, you can argue with me all day on price for square footage, but this is what the seller's willing to do. If your client's comfortable with that, we can move forward. If they're not, then they can move on. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's why I like being on the seller side. All your buyer's problems can go away if you work on listings and focus on that. Refer out your buyers. Get a buyer's agent. There's so many other things to do on this. The problem people are having with this is their business model is not set up focused on listings where you could help three to four times the amount of people. But my list, all my businesses, I have to, to find them a home before they'll list. 
So that puts a real damper on things. No, no, no. This is experience and education. This is the problem. Okay, so you could be losing yourself a small fortune by doing it in that oh, yeah. order. Are you familiar with a buy-sell analysis? This is a bird's eye view of all the factors that go into buying a home and selling a home. And if you do it in the wrong order, you could be costing yourself a small fortune. Okay, this is education. I'll give you the dumbed down version really quickly here on this, all right? Mm -hmm. So I'll take out a sheet of paper, okay? And I'll write this down. You wanna buy a house first, okay? Now, you haven't even put your home on the market yet. Let's go with that situa so a situation, okay? Now, how much more do you think you're gonna have to pay for this place because they're gonna risk you putting yours on the market and taking time to get it sold. So they're taking a risk. That doesn't make sense. You need to pay enough for them to take that risk. So how much more, I would ask the buyer, how much more do you think you'd have to pay versus not having this contingency in it at all? I even advocated renting for six months because the market might be different. Well, the, my, the, my point is this, you go failed. through, you get them to answer the question. Well, maybe we have to pay 10 grand more to do that that way, Brian. Okay, you pay 10 grand more to get that house. So you have a home sale contingency, not even a home close contingency. Okay, great. You get the, first, you get the property that you think you want. Now we got to get your property listed. Now, are you going to price it a little high to see if you can get it, leave some room for negotiation? Oh no, you got to price it at the market value or possibly below because you have a time frame in that purchase contract that you need to contract on your place. So the first offer that comes in, how much less do you think you're going to take on your current listing so that you get the other property? Five, 10, 20 grand difference, you know, less. Well, if it's 20 grand difference and you're buying the one for 10 grand more, that's 30 grand because you did it in the wrong order. It should have been listing first. So you're in a position of power for the negotiations. It's a buy sell analysis and I'll write out the numbers for them. And I want to engage them on asking how much more on a $300,000 house do you think you'd have to pay if other, if other offers didn't have the situation in it? You get them to engage you on it. It's the education of the agent that's so important to educate the client. They want to lose a small fortune. That's up to them. My mistake on that part then. And it's, this is just learning the process. And anything worth doing well is worth doing poorly until you can get it down pat. That's a Zig Ziglar quote. Anything that worth hurts. doing is worth doing poorly until you can get it down pat. So that's the same. If you, people are working on open houses, Brian, I do open houses every weekend. I don't get anything from it. How long have you been doing it for? Two weeks. No, no, no. Do it for two years and come back to me. You know, that type of thing. Okay, that's when you hear it, it resonates with you. You're in that situation, you're more likely to change it. So I'm happy to show you more about that. We can do that on another call. We can do that next week. Different techniques to overcome the objections of the buyers or the sellers to make sure, because most, most agents, we're, we're letting them be the real estate professionals when we're the real estate professionals. And we got to stay sharp on these things. So Marshall, was that, was that helpful? Yes, sir, it was. I didn't, didn't mean to pick on you on this. I just want to make sure that I'm passionate about this subject because I don't want you to feel like I have to do it this way. You don't have to do it this way. These are the other options if you can use the right verbiage and, and convince them of what's in their best interest. And I, I, I want them stronger. to write. What's that? I should have been stronger. I should have been more adamant about let's get this one sold while the market is hot. Right. Because she, it, we, it took, so, she couldn't find anything. So she, now it's not the right time to sell. So, but well, I just need to stay on top of her for January. So the whole thing of this too is don't just tell somebody something you can show them. Some people are visual. Yeah. Some people are more auditory. Some people are both. So you need to write it out for them. I mean, I just get a notepad and I'm writing it out. Put a line down the middle. Okay. Do it where you sell first or where you buy first. And then you do the numbers on it. Okay. How much more you have to pay for the house? How much less you can take for your current house? You go through these things, you add up the costs. Now on the other side, when you're a stronger buyer, you have your pre-approval, everything's done. No issues here. You know, yeah, it's a home closed contingency, but, or you've already closed out on it too, or there's no contingency. You're in a much stronger position. Because as a listing agent, I don't want a home close. I don't want a home sale. I'm not, I tell my sellers, do not accept a home sale contingency. You don't know how good this agent is. You don't know how prepared the seller is to sell their home. I can look it up, but it's not necessarily an area in maybe out of state where I can't physically see it other than the pictures online. I don't, you know, I can pull up a market analysis, 
but the market determines it, not necessarily me. So I advise my listings all the time. Don't take a home sale contingency. I tell them to come back when you got your place under contract and we'll be happy right. to talk to you. We even tried a lease or a six month lease with a guaranteed purchase within 30 days of the close on their existing house. A lease that first one. and then close later. Yeah. The, so see, the, the, the seller doesn't get their money and then they can't move on. But it covers their overhead. So yeah, but, but, it was an estate. So it was, it was a smart thing in that case. Okay. Just the, the realtor didn't want it because she didn't get her money and she's adamant she's going to get right. her 540 and right you want to get you want to get the, the seller wants to get their money the agent wants to get their money play into that hand okay yeah i don't have a lot of people who are are, are jumping up and down by having at least for a period of time and then purchased lease to purchase type stuff that was much more popular almost 18 years ago when i got into the real estate business but there was banks and lenders who were who were actually funding these things too this, yeah. These frustrations that I'm hearing from everybody here is, is a product of you not having the education in the business and the experience. Now, that's not, I'm not picking on you on that. I'm saying it's no. an observation so that you know to ask the right questions. All right, this is all about asking better questions. And this is mm -hmm. where I say sellers and buyers ask the wrong questions too many times that I literally wrote a book for sellers purposely because I asked the wrong question what's the yeah. price of my home and what's what's your commission those are the wrong questions that okay. lead to bad answers versus the question should be how are you gonna you know how much money am I gonna put in my pocket at the end of the day and how are you gonna get me more money than anybody else those are the better questions okay you know? but these and, are homes that have been on the market for a year so I'm like you know, you would think they would be a little bit amenable to some unique things. So the, the word that's coming to my mind is stupid right now. Okay. <laughs> some people are stupid. Okay. The buyer or the seller. <laughs> some people are stupid. Some sellers are stupid and the agents are stupid <laughs> for sitting on those stupid. listings. Yes. Okay. It's just stupid. The agent's okay. probably working for free. Nothing's yep. worse than an overpriced listing. Nothing that's worse. Because you, you don't get paid. <laughs> right. Until it closes. It's right. like showing houses and they will never write a contract. It's stupid, but you have to acknowledge that and prepare your client for that or yourself for that. And either it works in the terms you like or you move on. Now, What's if the average working, lead time to get to your skill set? What's that? What's the average lead time to get to your skill set? What skill set in particular? The buyer, the seller side, the agent side? Both. We? Both. One, creative negotiation. Two, the ability to close the seller and the, li the listing. It's, it's really getting the education from the people who know how to do this. Now, okay. what do I tell people? Hey, you get through 100 deals. It's a start. That's, that's where you have the experience to recognize the educational value of it too. Now, be in mind, I didn't get some of this education until I was quite a few years into the business. All right, I knew how to sell, but I didn't know some of these techniques within the real estate industry specific to those negotiations. I knew how to negotiate right. to a certain degree, but those tactics, not the strategy of the negotiation, the tactics of it, that is, the, that, that is a game changer for me, that I was able to overcome more objections than anything else. I was able to see the bigger picture, to see 10 steps down the road. And when I see somebody screwing up at step one, it's like, whoa, we're going to stop right here. And they're like, what do you mean stop right here? Yeah, because it's going to lead us to step 10. And it's just, a, we're going to go 10 steps and waste our time. We right. need to be going the right direction. So as the value, just not how to I just want to get there faster. And this is, this is why I do coaching and training for agents to get them there faster because so many agents have belief systems of what the way it is. Remember the stupid agents sitting on properties for years, you know? <laughs> okay. I, I, I can't <laughs> say the, the sellers are stupid buy before they sell. <laughs> the sellers have no idea. They're not the real estate professionals. I blame the agents. Okay for accepting an overpriced listing. And so I got a listing. Yeah, but you didn't get a saleable one. I love agents who are like that. I got a new listing, but did you get a saleable one? And are you, how long, you, I don't even have servicing. I'm servicing my listing and my marketing plan. I mean, I had some, some one, a uh, video guy go through my marketing plan, go, you have nothing about servicing your listings. I go, I don't service them, I sell them. Half, the majority of my properties sell in seven days or less. Yes. What, what do you mean That's service? I'm here to sell it. I'm not here to hold their hand and bake them cookies. I'm here to sell the damn property, be done with it. Yes. <laughs> so I set those expectations up front. I'm a little more firm on this and I don't take every listing. So if, I don't know if you guys have heard of some of my other trainings. I did that um, on Saturday, I did the training about listing presentation conversions. I'll do it again on the 24th, uh, Saturday the 24th. You guys 
you have heard it, hear it again. Repetition's the key. Um, I do the $1 million listings before the appointment the first Tuesday of each month in the Icon Auditorium. And I have a whole coaching training program. And if anybody is interested in that, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to talk about that too, if, you know, I can help on that. And one of the ways, if you guys want, I'm not here to push in. I'm just here to give you guys, help you guys out here today. But if you're ready for the next step, I just put my coaching website in there. And there's, there's a calendar on there. You can sign up for a coaching consultation with me. I'm happy to go through some of these things with you, if that would be helpful. So I'm not here to pitch stuff. I'm just, if you're ready for the next point in your career to get that education and to go through that with somebody who's done it before and who's trained. I mean, I've been doing coaching and training for 13 years. Okay. Um, and, and, and really it's been the majority of my career is a side gig. And now it's probably more of a majority of what I do too. I want to see agents get to where they want to go. So hopefully that was helpful, Marcia. It was. Thank you. I need to fix a lot. <laughs> Well, it, awareness is the key, everybody here. Awareness, just being aware of certain things and then asking the questions from there. It's just part of the process. And I, I had one of my coaching clients say, you know, I'm, I'm 50 something years old. I'm not where I wanna be financially. Got some debt, got this, got this. And I said, no, you're in the perfect place in your career, in your life, because you're at where you wanna be in your career. You just haven't hit the income that you wanna hit yet, but you're at really where you wanna be. And all everything, all the culmination of all your life experiences have brought you to this point that has made you ready, receptive to learning and changing those things so that you can succeed at a high level. Be in mind, the majority of people don't make their fortune in their 20s and 30s, okay? It's usually in their 40s and 50s where they really start to make their money. So think of it that way. Um, we'll keep going here. I'm running out of time here today, unfortunately. Talking about consistency, oh my gosh, that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a calendar one. Now I have a video called Scheduling for Success. Okay, check that out in the workplace group, Icon Agent Brian Ernst Free Trainings in Workplace or on Facebook and just type in scheduling for success. There's a video on that, and that's how to set up your calendar. You need an accountability partner too, okay? But that's one of those things to set it up so you stay consistent, you follow your calendar and you have an accountability partner to make sure you're doing that. And the awareness piece is, yeah, my kids are distracting me, or my spouse is, or my mother is, or my father is, or you're more aware of it than anything else because you can look at your schedule and you didn't do these things and you know what you didn't do. I'm not saying it fixes it. It puts you on the right mindset and the awareness piece to make those changes. That's the short answer on consistency, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully that was helpful. Um, getting listings. That's the other topic we didn't cover here today, but here we go. That should be your main focus in real estate is listings. Listings are the name of the game, is the name of the game, okay? You get your sign out there, you get exposure, you get advertisements. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this to, to everybody else in a whole different way. Think to yourself, how many people do you know in real estate that made just so much money in real estate sales? No pension, no spouse's income, no second job, just real estate sales, no owning a brokerage, no downlines, uplines, all this other stuff, this recruiting, none of this, just real estate sales. How many people did this to such a high degree that they could retire? The thing is this, you need to focus on listings because that's the way to advertise yourself, to make a name for yourself so that when those opportunities come up, to, and people like their fortunes and I would say owning a brokerage, but that's actually few and far between, okay? Um, it could be a coaching training program, books, speaking events, uh, charity stuff that, that gets whole name recognition, politics, acting. I know agents who've done all these things and they've made so much more owning title companies and being part of a bigger picture thing, but they got it because they were in it and they were, well, let's be honest, they took those opportunities when it came up. And I have, I have one person in particular who, his wife's an agent, he helps agents with a marketing company, and he walked into $3.1 million of investment properties with zero money down and all pulling a profit from the start. He got that connection because of what he's doing. And he was aware of that and he grabbed it. How cool is that? So 
the money in this is in real estate, but you need to focus on listings. Very few buyers, agents, or people are buyer focused, do, do crazy, amount, crazy amount of money because it takes so long. Listings are the name of the game. If you have a buyer because you sold their listing, they have two buyers, they're more likely to buy. It changes the statistics. So getting listings, how you got this focus on listings from day one, period. Focus on listings. Buyers are just the gravy. You an open house, what's your focus? Listings. You want the nosy neighbors. You want to list their properties, okay? Buyers the gravy, okay? Those are the ones on top. And, and do you want to work with these people? Do you, you don't have to work with anybody. Change your attitude and mindset on the buyer's side of things or else they're going to drag your butt around and they are going to emotionally and sometimes physically exhaust you. And then when those other opportunities, opportunities come up, you're not ready for it. And it takes time. It really does. In my career, I was gross profit. And this is going back, trying to recover from the housing recession. I was making like 200,000 a year, got up to like 300,000. And it's like, I'm maxing out seven days a week, killing myself. This is gross commissions. So I brought in a buyer's agent again at that time, because I let one go during the housing recession. And my income the next year went down a hundred grand. So it went down about 200 grand. Okay. This is gross. Now that next, because I paid her about a hundred grand to work with the buyers. Now, if you paid out showing assistance, different, and I'm happy to teach you the difference in this, but that next year, because I spent so much time focused on the listing side of it. Yeah. I made less money because I paid her. Well, guess what? The next year, my gross commissions went up to 400,000 because I was listing focused much more. I wasn't, my head wasn't all crazy on buyers all over the place being a firefighter. So it is a time frame. It takes, it's not an overnight process to get there. So I want to thank everybody for being here today. I hope I've answered your guys' questions. I, join me the same time next week if you'd like. Um, that's why I ask questions right up front. What's your biggest challenges in real estate? And I'm happy to see if I can answer that point in the right direction. And if anything, I hope you guys have gained some awareness of a few things because I can't solve all the problems right away. It takes time to adjust your business. So I thank you. I appreciate you being here. I, I honor you for this because so many agents aren't doing this and asking questions, even if they're not the best questions to start, that's okay. You got to start somewhere. And then it's like, if I say that's not the best question, okay, Brian, what's a better question? You know, engage in it. Don't retreat from it, engage in it because that's how you learn about that engagement. And it's more, I, Marcia, I, you're, you're right in that realm of it didn't, doesn't work exactly the way you want, think it works. Are you ready to shift to the next level? We'll bump your, your income up and you'll have more time, but are you ready to take on that training and that experience of it? And that's up to you guys. So I want to thank you for being here. Appreciate it. If I can help in any way, please reach out to me and uh, hope you guys have a great week.